getting rid of them. So he wanted me to make sure that you all knew what his tutorial was going to be about. And our next speaker will go directly to Will Myrick talking about GPS uh, beamforming with RTL SDRs. Great, thank you. All right, glad to be with you today. Uh, my name is Will Myrick. I'm part of a company called Insco. Um, we specialize in high precision RF ranging devices. And uh, we're in an era now where signals of opportunity as well as being able to have your own devices are important for positioning. Uh, and so today I want to give you uh, an example of a project that I'm looking at where I have a distributed set of sensors and I'm wanting to do beamforming on those sensors. But I'm um, using very inexpensive uh, SDRs. Those are the RTL SDRs. And I want to at least present some aspects of that and how one maybe could use that to um, potentially improve your positioning information in a situation where um, you may be either in in a channel environment where you know urban or you're in some other place where some sensors can view the GPS satellites, others can't, is there a way to potentially syn synchronize um, those sensors and then get a better position, um, a better position estimate from that point? So I'll start off with at least uh, giving you background. I guess eh, some of that's cut off. Um, I'll give you some background information about um, what started this. So recap from GRCon 2016, um, I brought actually a device that ended up creating a four-channel RTL, RTL SDR-based system. I was using a, uh, a Jetson TK1, uh, and I used that as my sampler to record all the data and then do post-processing on it. And at the time, I wanted to figure out, can I come up with a beamformer uh, that is uh, <clears throat> based on these RTL SDRs that don't have any type of clock synchronization at all. So pretty much it is a purely software synchronization solution. Uh, and am I able enough to do enough phase tracking and get my measurements properly in such a way that I can actually do coherent beamforming uh, without actually connecting those RTL SDRs? And so initially last year I said, okay, I got to a point well, where I at least showed some initial results. Uh, and this year, I decided to take the asynchronous processing and actually come up with a GPS beamformer, uh, and I'll show you some results with that. Uh, part of the work I wanted to say uh, that led up to this is some of my thesis work with anti jamming for GPS. The motivation was a lot of times, if you want to do GPS array processing, uh, most of the time those platforms are expensive to get you know, multiple arrays, calibrated arrays, and all these things. So I said, well, you know what? What if you could sort of, tr sort of like build your own array where you can post-process and do other things like uh, music and, and eigenvector decomposition and things like that. So maybe an idea is to take very inexpensive um, cheap antennas, patch antennas, link them up with some RTL SDRs, and then come up with a data set that you could then post-synchronize to then do all of your processing. Uh, and so that's sort of what motivated this as, a, as an inexpensive way of, of doing GPS beamforming. Uh, from that, I started noticing uh, different things that were occurring with the GNU Radio, and there's this whole group right now that's using GNU Radio. Um, their software is called GNSSSDR, and they've pretty much built an entire GPS receiver around the GNU Radio platform. Um, and so what interesting things you could do is that I could pre-process the data, use that to get my position estimates, or just um, you know, do potential add tree modules to then add within that type of framework. So, I'm curious about that as a research effort, but in the meantime, I wanted to figure out, well, I still have to pre-process the data to get it to that point where I can even leverage that software. And so I'm leveraging, I actually code um, from Bohr. Uh, he came up with a book a couple of years ago, Software Defined uh, GPS and Galileo Receiver, in that he lists all the code uh, from MATLAB that pretty much gives you the entire description of a GPS receiver from beginning to end. So you can look at what it takes to track the different PRN codes, um, the, the, the PLL, the, the uh, phase lock loop, the phase lock loop and the frequency lock loop information, uh, and then use all of that to demodulate, decode, and you can pretty much have the full chain of a GPS receiver. So this is something that I thought I wanted to at least uh, make, make an announcement of and, and let you uh, guys know that this book's available. And pretty much everything that I did as far as this, this code, as far as this, this um, a a asynchronous process, I leveraged that uh, book. So it's a matter of taking the code that was in there, understanding what was going on, and then modifying that in a way that would allow me to create this GPS beamformer. 
So what am I going to talk about today? Well, today is pretty much the culmination of uh, what I talked about initially from JRCon 16, but now I've sort of completed the framework of the asynchronous uh, process. Uh, so we're going to talk about time frequency phase estimation alignment. I'm going to show you some results from that using some RTL SDRs. And again, I'm not sharing any common external uh, reference in terms of the uh, actual hardware itself. Then, then I'm going to talk a little bit about GPS beamformer um, and some results relative to the GNSS SDR. And then position estimates. I want to show you <clears throat> some interesting results um, after doing the beamforming. And then after that, I'll show you um, at least uh, an example if I have some time. Uh, what I decided to do was install the GNSS SDR on a Raspberry Pi 3. So at least I uh, have a, a portable embedded form factor that one could use to actually show these results. So what's the big deal? Uh, right now at Insco, we're focusing on robust positioning, navigation, and timing. That's a big deal uh, for a lot of different people that are interested in knowing your location and also being able to transfer time. Um, what's interesting is that in this realm, a lot of IoT devices are starting to pop up all over the place. Uh, and with those IoT devices, they, of course, are tracking their position, navigation, timing information. Um, so what's interesting is, from the beamform solution space, uh, if I look, at, you know, look back at all the different research, thesis work, and whatever it's doing, uh, spatial beamforming is a very, very uh, nice way right, of dealing with uh, jammers, uh, dealing with multipath, uh, as well as dealing with um, uh, spoofers. So there's ways and uh, there's different publications that come out, you know, how do you deal with anti-spoofing? If you have at least two receivers, uh, you can figure out a way to at least determine if you're being spoofed um, by looking at carrier phase differences of the actual uh, spoofer signal itself. And so with spatial beamforming, one could say, well, what if I have all these IoT devices that are out there? And one of the requirements is that I want them to have low swap C. If I want them to have low swap C and I also want them to share PNT information, Maybe a concept is I could have them to share their PNT information, but then come up with a more robust PNT solution where individually it's not that great for them, but combining them together, you could maybe have some kind of robust solution. So what would that combining be? Well, if it's a low swap C over to the, um, to the right here, uh, what was, what was, was, very, what was very interesting in the, in the aspect of, uh, of, of, of this graph is that I have a, usually a variant of different SDRs. So like in Insco, we are uh, working on what we call a TCRD. It's our time and communications ranging device that is purely focused on ranging versus communications. And a lot of times in SDRs, you're focusing on communications first versus ranging. So in, our, in my world, I'm like, oh, well, why not just try to marry as much as you can uh, both type of SDRs as well as maybe leverage some low swap C devices. And so that's where the RTL SDR came into play for um, potentially come up with some very interesting type of research. So when I look at the robust PNT framework, I'm looking, really looking at it from an aspect of a fusion of software-defined radio measurements. And if I can fuse those measurements at the RF level to some degree, uh, maybe I can come up with some robust solution versus uh, a post-processing um, solution. So that's sort of where things are in terms of uh, what's available. And, and then, of course, I could have all these individual GPS receivers, all these other RF sensors, and then a combination of those measurements could potentially come up with what I'm calling a robust PNT solution. So GPS beamforming with the RTL SDRs. Uh, for the most part, they lack external clock inputs. Uh, they lack references. Uh, so you pretty much have an inexpensive software-defined radio. Uh, you can sample as high as consistently, you know, 2.4 megahertz if you want to sustain stream uh, to disk. And, uh, you know, you have little things you can control, sort of like, you know, gains and things like that. But for the most part, you can have four independent streams um, streaming across USB. And with that, uh, the question to bear is, can you do GPS beamforming with that? Uh, and my answer is, yes, you can, uh, especially from a GPS satellite. Uh, what's interesting from a GPS satellite is providing you enough information that you can actually extract out the necessary information to do post-synchronization. And, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. So what do people normally do? Well, if you go out in uh, you know, web, Google, uh, RTL SDRs, multi-RTL approach, that'll show up. A couple of guys that have come up with ways to gang up different RTL uh, SDRs 
They normally wire them. They have common clocks in terms of how they wire them such that you don't have to deal with, um, um, you don't have to deal with offsets associated with your, your, your actual clocks. And usually from that point on, they still say, well, you have to deal with the delay. Because of course, if I'm in the OS and I'm saying record at the same time, um, each SDR is going to record you know, at its own sort of time because it's, it's within the delay of the actual OS itself. So one could be off by a millisecond, two milliseconds, three milliseconds. So you have to compensate for that. But even once you do that, um, you still have to deal with uh, phase. And phase is a key um, piece here in terms of coherency. Uh, and so once you deal with phase and coherency, uh, now you have to deal with the different differences actually in the, in the in A to D, in the samples themselves. Uh, and so what's interesting is that a GPS uh, waveform in itself provides a very nice way to extract all of that uh, information. So you don't really have to deal uh, with the wiring aspects here. But again, it is a software syn synchronization, interesting concept approach where you really are keeping track, very, very precise uh, track of the different measurables. And, and I'm going to talk to you about those. So what do we have for the most part? Well, what I came up with is what I'm calling a software synchronization approach, uh, where you give me a stream of uh, data samples, snapshots, and I will figure out how to make those snapshots appear as if they were taken by a single receiver that had a common clock and a common phase reference. So how do you do that? Well, the idea is that um, I may have asynchronous snapshots, but I can always make those snapshots synchronous to something else that's there. And when I say that, that means relative. So a lot of times I may have these four asynchronous snapshots, but maybe I will pick one SDR to be as my reference, and then I can match all my other SDRs such that they're relative to that SDR. And now those SDRs become synchronous relative to the SDR that I choose. So in doing that for this process, first of all, there's the GPS extraction process where I'm extracting out the uh, actual uh, GPS signals, um, you know, going through the Doppler compensation, uh, and I'm extracting out the data. And with that, it's really great, right? I have all this data that's giving me all my navigation information. That data in itself, I can cross-correlate with the other SDRs. So that's my first course synchronization approach. Um, I take the actual data streams themselves, however long it, it is, uh, and I can cross-correlate, and that'll tell me, tell me my roughly how far off the each SDR is relative um, to, the, to whatever my reference is in milliseconds. All right, then after that, if you keep you know, sort of following this flow, I can do fine chip code synchronization. And the fine is based on what? You can guess. Uh, the CA code. Once I'm able to get locally at least where I am in milliseconds, now I have the CA code to actually uh, allow me to get microseconds in terms of figuring out where I need to be uh, relative to the actual code itself. So I have the bit synchronization, I have the chip synchronization, and then at that point, the trick is how do I figure out now how to uh, coherently um, uh, line these up such that my carrier phase is, 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 is actually proper. So once I do the carrier phase extraction per PRN code, uh, and in this case, I can, I can actually leverage just one PRN code out of all the codes that are there. I can get a global <clears throat> clock drift offset. And so what I'm showing here, if you look at the bottom right uh, plot, that actually is a carrier phase and code frequency extraction, I can find the relative drifts of the clocks relative to the SDR that I'm, the RTL SDR that I'm considering as my reference. And then it's a matter of me compensating for that. So now once I compensate for that, if you look at that, look at the, uh, the math from that point, now I have just phase differences. I have phase differences over the time intervals in which I've actually collected the data. And then if you look at it from phase differences, if you think about what a GPS beamformer is doing, is really lining up the phases in such a way that I get maximum signal to, signal to noise ratio. And that's really the key. So understanding all of those things and tracking all those variables, you're able to, um, do fairly well in terms of uh, creating this sort of synchronized uh, software or actually synchronized snapshots. So let's talk a little bit about the math. Well, from, me, from my research in terms of, uh, uh, from, um, from, from anti-jam uh, you know, processing and GPS uh, adaptation, you can pretty much create what I'm calling a space-time uh, processor. That's sort of what uh, I'm showing there to, to the left. If I wanted to, 
the, the goal here was to create a set of samples from each SDR such that eventually I can actually do the fun stuff that I want to do, which is respect to doing adaptive beamforming, subspace signal processing, uh, using all these type of, uh, um, all type of subspace algorithms. But actually, I'm finding out from this research, it's just fun in just getting to that point because I had to track all these variables very precisely and figure out what the phase references were. The big deal is really the SDR uh, clock drift model. And the assumption is that, yes, that the data that I'm going to have a basis model somewhat where, yeah, can, there's some linear drift that I can actually extract out. And then once I do that, the plot to the right um, that's below the clock drift sort of shows the differences of the actual phases of one of the SDRs uh, re relative to the, well, all of the SDRs relative to the, the one SDR. And I'll talk to which SDR to actually, uh, th that I chose to actually be my reference um, based on some analysis that I'm going to going to show you later on. Um, so what did I do to create the snapshot? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk through each component of the process, and I'll talk to each one and, and try to explain um, the whole step. So RTL-SDR, there is a program you can get. You can compile it you know, for Raspberry Pi or whatever, you know, Linux uh, system you're running. And you can use that to actually capture. Um, usually they have an example where they say you can use this to capture a file for so many seconds um, for a particular signal. So what I did was I said, well, let me just write a little script that will actually simultaneously say all four SDRs start recording. Uh, and so what I have here up in the upper right corner is this little script uh, that I wrote that pretty much gives you the sample rate, uh, sample at 2.4 um, at this point. Um, and uh, my, my center frequency was at 1.57542 gig, um, I have sample at 2.4 meg, and you can see the gains that I've also set up in here as well, uh, over there. And then, all, and then at the same time, I set the number of samples. So in this particular case, I wanted to take 60 seconds worth of data. So what I have is after I do that process, I have these four files that are asynchronous. So the idea is to come up with an algorithm uh, that will take those four files, and at the end of it, those four files now look synchronous to another processor, and another processor could be a good radio-based system, it's like the GNS SDR, or some other process that, um, that, that, that you may want to use for research. And this is where, again, you can feed this in, and now if it looks like a beamformer in terms of the coherency, I can do all the other spatial beamforming or stat processes that one could then um, um, have, have fun with. So let's talk about the example data set. Um, so what I did was I decided to set up my RTL SDRs. I had a two by two element array, put on top of my car, uh, parked real close to uh, building such that there's some multipath that's involved. So I didn't, you know, I didn't make it uh, one of those environments where it was completely void of multipath. And then I said, all right, let's look at the output of a standard GPS receiver using the code that I, that I referred to uh, early in Bohr's book. Uh, for the uh, actual acquisition. And so what this menu shows, uh, or this table, shows you the parameters that came out of that. For the data set that was recorded for the four different SDRs, the acquisition that came out of that was pretty much, you know, I could track six satellites, but in certain cases for some of the SDRs, I could only see five. All right, and so that gives me an idea of, okay, yeah, I have independent RTL SDRs, the patchy antennas, um, they're going to probably catch waves coming off at different you know, angles. Uh, and there could be some interference, or one may not, you know, one may be seeing some interference, the other one's not. You would think that it would be somewhat similar uh, because they were within, um, they were within uh, you know, lambda over two of each other. But having the, the way the receiver and everything's set up and everything's independent, Yes, I, I, would, I would expect it, at least it seemed was somewhat consistent where I saw at least some of the same uh, type of satellites in the field of view. So with this as a data set, the first question is, where do I start? Uh, for me, I chose RTL SDR 4, because 4, of course, it had all six satellites in the field of view. And for the uh, SNR, PRN29 was the one that at least was the strongest that came in. So that would be your sort of like obvious choice. Let's take the strongest signal first. Use that as a reference. And what's interesting is in this approach, um, once you use that, the, 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 um, the PR encode of, of 29, that allows you to do enough synchronization, when I say enough synchronization, 
It allows you to do the coarse bit. It allows you to do the chip. It allows you to even deal with the, um, the carrier drift, or not carrier drift, the, the clock drift. And then from that point on, everything is PRN dependent. So I could have chosen any of these uh, PRNs to actually go through the process of bit code and carrier phase extraction, but uh, I ended up in this case just choosing the PRN because PRN 29 because that was the that was actually the, the, the highest um, in terms of SNR. So here's the process. This is an output of uh, one of the data snapshots. I zoomed in on it. Gives you an idea of how how far off um, I was. And notice here I also chose our RTL SDR4 because it was the easiest in terms of doing delays. Uh, one of the things I did was I created files along the way as I was aligning or going through, the, going through the synchronization process. So at any point in time, I could take those files and look at the analysis and see where I was in terms of the coherency. Um, so in this case, this just gives you an idea of how far off. Um, and this is, again, when you see, see this 62 milliseconds, 24 milliseconds, 19 milliseconds, this is just the delay that it took for that job to get kicked off, right, from the Linux process. Because I'm in, I'm in Linux system, I'm saying go, I had a script that said I want all these to start at the same time, but of course they're all operating on their own sort of, sort of threads. Uh, so they kicked off at different points in time. This is the first after the alignment in uh, bit space, and then I went to code space for the alignment. And then in code, I had 2,400 samples per, um, per chip in this case. So I could uh, align up uh, accord, accord, according to that in terms of my chip space. I'm sorry, not 2,400. 2,400 samples per, per coat. Uh, and so with that, I was able to line up uh, my chip space and at least get within the resolution of the uh, 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 of, of 2,400 such that I was aligned. Uh, and so once I did that for each particular uh, SDR, that at least allowed me to get my localized alignment. And that's the best that I was able to do, at least at this point, from, uh, from a time alignment perspective, once doing bit and then once doing code. And once I had the bit alignment and the code alignment, I was able to now focus in on the clock drift. Now the clock drift, again, is interesting. This is a uh, zoomed in view of the clock drift over 60 seconds of the data that I had, where uh, RTL SDR 4 is the reference. So as you can see, that should be at zero because it's as if I was taking the e to the j of the drift associated with four Conjugating with itself, that should be zero, and then everything else is just a matter of taking the delta of that uh, to actually do the compensation. And then once I do the compensation, uh, I have a differential sort of carrier phase analysis where now you can see the variance associated with each phase estimate uh, associated with each RTL SDR relative to RTL SDR four. Now with that, I decided to just go ahead and do that, of course, for each PRN. And so now, if you think about this, this is the space that I want to be in. This is the space now that I have everything available to me such that I can align the codes where I want to. Because it's just a matter of me now figuring out what is the delta taking this, this, this phase, and I can actually form my beam former directly from these measurements. It's just a matter of me figuring out, do I want to be positive, do I want a negative, in terms of the summation of, uh, of my actual uh, signals. And so what I'm showing here, next couple of slides, um, just examples of what I was able to track out for each uh, SDR relative to uh, the RTL SDR4. So this is 13, this is two. And of course, in some cases, you know, if, if, if I wasn't able to track that signal at all, I, the, 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 there was no reference there. So in this particular case, like Perian 2, um, I was only, only able to do uh, a relative, a relative uh, differential carrier phase relative to, uh, to four with, with just one and, and three. And this is PRN 20 and then PRN five. So with all of that, all of the asynchronization, trying to figure out what to do to synchronize, dealing with the things that are offset, what ended up being my sort of final answer? So these are some results that I wanted to present today. So pretty much from this, I was able to, per PRN, have a decent amount of, of gain, not perfect. Now notice that um, the red is the RTL SDR4. So that is my extracted after carrier phase extraction, um, the IQ plot, this showed it. Notice how tight that is. 
Uh, and now I'm trying to do this software synchronization, you know, beamformer. And in that, notice, yeah, some fuzz. It's fuzzier. So it's a little bit large. It's not quite you know, as tight. But I do have some gain that's there actually associated with each particular PRN. Now, in the ideal beamformer construct, you would beamform per PRN, and you would combine that within your actual tracking loops itself. And that's where a lot of your beamformers, that's really where you get the gain of the power from the beamform. Because now, per satellite, I'm tracking it with the best look that I can in terms of maximizing the, the this signal to noise ratio. And then if you do a, um, an interference mitigation algorithm, you would actually use that as prior knowledge to actually then suppress the, um, the, the interference that, 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 that would all also be in, in your field of view. Uh, and so that's, that's just sort of where you start from your basic uh, information. But it shows that, yeah, we were able to pretty much um, get a decent amount of, of, of gain from these RTL SDRs that were completely um, you know, asynchronous in measurements and do some type of beamforming. Again, not the most ideal, but, but it's something. Uh, and then this is an example where um, I just wanted to show you the output where I was running the GNSS SDR that's operating on the Raspberry Pi 3. Now, so I have this beamformer. I have all this information. Great. I can get something. The question now I was asking myself was, what about the position? Can I improve the position of what I had originally with these individual SDRs based on now this beamformer? And I would hope that I could potentially get some improvement and the results show, yes, it is possible. Now, if you look at the variance, you say, wow, this is 100 meters and all that. Great. But again, these are RTL SDRs that I'm using in the framework. And I'm not really tracking all the errors in terms of what was causing this. But I wanted to see from a global research sort of idea concept that, yes, it is possible to, to do some combination of very inexpensive RTL SDRs and get an improvement overall by this sort of, um, you know, ad hoc beamforming, um, tracking all these variables, and still get some improvements. And so what these next couple of charts just show, relative to each individual SDR, um, that you can do some uh, improvements in terms of the compactness of the uh, actual GPS measurements uh, with the beamformer. And this is uh, what I did here was I used an RTLS beamformer. I took a beamformer, rather than uh, combining all the different ones, I took a beamformer I took a single beamformer out of the different PRNs that I was constrained to, and I picked the best one. And so this is that result that, that, that actually shows that here. Um, so in summary, I pretty much am showing just initial results. There is some feasibility there of using GPS beamforming, utilizing RTL SDRs. And again, think about this as a concept of having a lot of different sensors. Scale this up. Um, I think there's a lot of different things you could do um, with this type of approach. Uh, not just with any RTL SDRs, but the so sort of concept is maybe I have a myriad of software defined radios. I have, um, you know, I have an Edis research radio, I have an Epic radio, I have, the, I have the RTL SDR radios. If I'm looking at those RF measurements themselves, there's possibly a way to combine that post process and maybe um, gain some insight on some signals that are out there that I wouldn't normally have uh, if I was just looking at it just from an individual SDR perspective. Uh, and so this pre-processing approach uh, allows exploration GPS beamforming, leveraging existing GNSS SDR process architectures. Again, if I have a GNU radio-based GNSS SDR, this is a pre-process that I could feed that, so I can now explore all these type of GPS beamforming approaches. Uh, and then the plan is to explore distributed GPS beamforming with a mixture of these SDRs. We have a couple of these SDRs uh, at ENSCO, and, uh, and the goal is to um, do some similar measurements, not just with the RTL SDR, but with the other SDRs. Uh, and then see what kind of results we can get based on that. And that is it. Okay, um, it's time for the break, but we have time for a question. The break will be in the tent uh, with the exhibits, and we'll go ahead and take a question. Thanks. Um, so, very good. Um, now, the improvements on location, um, did you get more than what you would normally get when you have perfect uh, um, reception or in perfect condition? Or are you talking about uh, improving something from bad to good? Yeah, so it's, it's the latter. It's improving something from bad to good. 
Okay. Uh, what I could have done was, uh, was had you know, the ideal answer in terms of where I was and determine how far I was off from that, but I didn't, I didn't choose that route. I could have, instead I wanted to see how good could I get from what I already have, and yeah, it's, it's, it's from bad to good. Thank you, and then uh, part two, I'm sorry. Um, um, were you able to um, compare results of um, when you reduced the n number of um, um, signals? So going from four to three to two in your, in your uh, spatial diversity. I could do that. I, I, I did not go down that path. I looked at it as, you know, if I have four, let me just work with what I have in terms of the four. Um, but you can see, at least from those results, like for, I think it was PRN2, um, you can see at least for, for that one, you know, for, yeah, for PRN2 where I only got 2.89, uh, that one was difficult in the sense that I, I, there was one SDR that just didn't pick it up at all. So you can look at that and get some insight into, oh, okay, well, if I lose one, how far off am I going to be? And then also in this is the era of the synchronization, right? You know, how well was I able to combine, at least for this one for PRN2, I could look further into the details of what really caused me not to be able to, to get as much gain as I thought that I, I should have had. Um, so yeah. <coughs> All right, anyone else? Okay, so I'll see you all in just under 30 minutes. Uh, we'll try to start back up on time. We're a little bit over now, but please go visit our exhibitors. <laughs>